fellow summoners, I am Pruitt. This is Jim Davis. And we are no conjurers of cheap tricks, or night rangers, or bad company. So don't be a deaf leopard and pay attention to this episode on Conjuration on WebDM. Jim, we're talking about Conjuration here. The bringing about of things. The quintessentially magical effect of literally pulling a rabbit out of a hat. Yeah. Right. That's conjuration. Mm -hmm. there, you know, making some, uh, a quarter out of a your corner ear. out of the ear. Yeah. Uh, and whether it's uh, you know sleight of hand or uh, pulling on the uh, planar energies that bind all realities together, they have their own <laughs> type of magic. It's an iconic school of Dungeons and Dragons magic. It's an iconic school of fantasy magic that transcends any one individual game. Conjuration is something that you might get Skyrim for one, and many other <laughs> Elder Scrolls uh, video games. It's iconic, but it's also a problem in some ways because uh, as any dungeon master knows or anyone who really like delves into the game action economy is a at a premium and being able to summon other actions to your side and and control those actions is mm -hmm. uh, an asset something that needs to be uh, carefully considered and uh, when it used in play you know you have tools available to uh, smooth out the rough edges that might come up from the use of those spells right as a spell school uh, you know, the player's handbook gives us a definition of this is the school uh, of magic that transports objects and creatures uh, from one location to another. And that could be between planes, like you know, plane shift, uh, gate, things like that, mm -hmm. um, or between two locations on the same plane, misty step, uh, dimension door, draw midges, instant summons, or or that create effects out of nothing. You know, and and I see these as more like calling objects. Or, or something across the plains, right? Whether it's like the Mighty Fortress spell <laughs> or, uh, or something more humble uh, like Entangle. There was nothing, now there's something. I like these, these are, they seem thematically appropriate. They're the most uh, internally consistent uh, of all the schools, not that I'm prizing consistency that much these days. Like I said, it's iconic, it's fun, right? Like you're just summoning things and well, conjuring them. Well, I mean, you know, I know that there are those that are tired of, of Tolkien references, but you know, I mean, he says himself, I'm not a conjurer of cheap tricks. <laughs> you, know. you don't have one of those bags, you know? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> I bet he did have one of those bags. They just have different kind of fireworks right, that come yeah, out yeah. of it. Now I want to make Gandalf's uh, bag of fireworks. Bag, bag of tricks. Mm, yeah. Where it's just mm. Roman candle. Those ones that just burn and look like poo coming out of the ground. No, I remember those. The yes, the poo, or yeah, whatever. The poo snakes. Yes, the <laughs> poo snake fireworks. I mean, you were literally conjuring something. Right, okay. As so far as the firework goes. So you, so you, if I wanted to make a segue. If you're using to make, you're, okay, we'll build on this segue. The idea of, uh, of, of number one, of just like little bitty things that you can do uh, yeah. is, is uh, you know, prestigitation covers that pretty well, but strictly conjuration school, uh, spell schools. Mm -hmm. It's a, it's a school that that bears a lot of overlap with transmutation and uh, evocation. And I'm starting to see this less as like competition and more the schools must represent like an, a, both an approach to magic by the practitioner as well as a source of magic that they're drawing upon. Mm -hmm. And so I'm starting to see the spell schools in, in a different light through this uh, series. And to me, the fact that there's so much overlap between evocation, conjuration, and transmutation, that really appeals to me because it suggests a, a world or a cosmology that has complexity, mm -hmm. that has nuance to it, and that uh, these spell schools are not as clear-cut as anyone would like because it's all a little messy. Magic is messy. Whether or not evocation is a sub-school of conjuration is a discussion that we had in the evocation episode, but you know, it's worth mentioning. These spells uh, produce effects that seem like other schools of magic, right? Uh, produce flame being one of those, like cantrip. It's conjuring just uh, some flame out of nowhere, which evocation does, which transmutation suggests it might be able to by, say, uh, rubbing the particles of fire elementals that are present in the prime material plane together and mm -hmm. cause, agitating them to a state of uh, combustion. Of ignition, yeah. Right. Uh, thinking about these things, whether you're a dungeon master trying to put together a cohesive uh, sort of worldview for magic or you're a player who uh, finds themselves in command of a conjurer, it gives you a chance to like flavor your spells, to flavor the magic, to think about how it works, and then now you can build a sort of concept based on that, or a description, or something like that. What's what's a consideration to really think of with conjuration? I mean, like okay. ob yeah. obviously one of the one of the biggest considerations is the creatures. The creatures, right? Like this is the spell school where, similar almost to uh, transmutation and uh, the access to the monster manual that it gets through polymorph and the like spells. Players get a similar access to the monster manual through conjuration magic. And 
Because of that, there are, well, let's just say there's a lot of complications that can arise. And 5th edition Dungeons & Dragons is trying to find this sweet spot between a uh, hassle for the dungeon master, uh, a satisfying experience for the player, and not inconvenience for the rest of the group. Because what's often forgotten about when we, when we think about these spells is the fact that there are other players here who have to sit through you summoning eight wolves. Or have to sit through a whole negotiation process of you contacting a, you know, an agent of your deity and negotiating a price for them doing a particular task or something like that. My solution for those is to get the other players involved in those moments. Don't separate them out. When you're talking about conjuring creatures into existence, what you're really talking about is giving this particular player more actions than anybody else necessarily at the table. In a combat situation, that can easily tip the tide in favor of the players and can lead to a situation where a dungeon master feels like they're constantly having to increase the difficulty and challenge of their fights uh, and the inventiveness of their enemies. But at the same time, combat begins to drag down because there's more combatants involved. It becomes an arms race between uh, you know uh, a party of... <laughs> God forbid, multiple conjurers and summoners and the like, which you can have, right? Uh, and why wouldn't you? Because you're maximizing your concentration uh, you know, slots and the like. There's a balance there. Yeah. And the conjuration spells are seeking to find that balance. That's why there are so many odd, you know, kind of restrictions on them. Some of them are meant to be used in combat. They take one action. Others of them take a, a minute to cast and are, you know, well, it's like, I guess you're doing that before combat, but in this particular case, we're talking about conjure animals, it's also a third level spell, whereas the others are higher level spells, and so it gives you a peek into how um, the spell system works and that you can sort of change the casting times of things and then you get a different level of spell. More on that in another video. The main thing is, is that whenever a player gets access to one of these spells, whether it's conjure animals, summon lesser demons, or all the way up to gate and conjure celestial, the idea is that you sit down between, ideally, the group, but at least the dungeon master and player and go, let's talk about how you want to use this spell. Mm -hmm. What are the kind of creatures you want to summon with this thing? What do you want to do with them? Are you thinking to, about using them in combat? Uh, are these going to be creatures that you have because you're just more into the idea of summoning creatures and you, you want the access to that? Having a conversation about this is the number one step because a lot of these things about who chooses what monster or creature is, is summoned depends on the spell, and some of the spells are fuzzy as to whose responsibility that is. That's just one thing. What happens when they lose concentration? What happens when, uh, you know, there's something uh, goes wrong, you know, and you lose control of the, of the creature? All of those things are worth a conversation before you have access to this magic. Like I said, it can smooth out a lot of things. Well, but also uh, another thing that, that having access to something like this gives is the chance for more quests. Just to Oh, sure. You know, if you want to summon some of these things, maybe you need to go ask them first. This especially touches on whether or not the player chooses what they can summon. And, yeah. and if you look at, say, the summoning type spells, most of them are conjure, but there's the, the ones in Xanathar's summon lesser demons and some are greater demons, which explicitly say, like, listen, the dungeon master is going to choose what, what type of demon shows up. You just tell me the CR. But other spells, it's like, well, it, it asks the player to say, I, I want one of these four options. Do I want one creature at CR2, two at CR1, et cetera, you know, four? It, one quarter, eight, it, you know, one eighth. The, the language of the spell sort of reads like the player is getting to pick both the number and the type of creature that shows up. Whereas Sage Advice, uh, you know, if you follow Sage Advice or, or follow Jeremy Crawford, will say like, no, the intent of the spell is that the player selects how many and the dungeon master chooses. But if you're like one of those groups where, you know, you don't follow Sage Advice, you don't really look, uh, you know, into these things that mm -hmm. much, then just the language of the spell is, is you, you know, you have to interpret that. Which one of you is going to pick the monsters? Sometimes it's a matter of convenience for the player to do the entire thing. And very often, that's what I go with, right? Like, I've got a lot of stuff going on. And if I have a tool at hand, like, say, D&D Beyond or something else that will let me quickly determine the, uh, you know, ranking CR of how many creatures are available, I will use that. But if I'm playing out of the book and, and you know, I'm at a convenience, game and I don't have otherwise ready access to that, then I might just be like, yeah, I'm, I'm, you know, just pick it. It goes on your initiative. Don't roll a separate initiative for it. Let's speed things up a bit, especially if I trust that player, you know, and yeah. I don't think that they're going to abuse it uh, or we've had a conversation beforehand. But if you're one of those DMs where you're like, I want to pick the, the creature or, or follow the letter of the spell as well as the intent of the spell and the player's like, well, I really want to summon a specific creature, then that's the opportunity to say, what if there was a quest you could go on to alter your specific use of this spell 
so that it calls a type of creature. You know, if you want to summon a particular elemental to your side, you, you know, you're, you don't want just any gallop dur, you want this one. <laughs> and, you know, maybe it's a matter of uh, finding that one and offering it something that it wants and befriending it as an NPC and sort of like building this relationship and rapport with it such that it offers you uh, a syllable of its true name which will allow you to uh, call it whenever, uh, whenever you cast one of these spells. And any number of things it could be like that, whether it's uh, visiting dryads in the forest and, and, and making offerings to them and, and showing sort of like reverence for them and, and protecting their groves in return as a gift, aka a reward that you supply the player, you would say like, yeah, you can summon me with this spell. You don't just mm -hmm. summon any random fey creature, you get me. Yeah. And, and, and you know, you start to build a relationship which then adds a new NPC to the game that the dungeon master can then bring to life and, and uh, complications can arise from its existence. Mm -hmm. And what if, you know, it's not supposed to be summoned? What if it has a boss that's like, why are you leaving all the time? You know, like, <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> what if the imp who gave you its true name is, is shirking some work back in hell? Now all of a sudden its uh, bosses come looking for it and it's like, oh, you're here? You're the one that's been summoning this guy? You're the one who's been summoning this guy. You know, and it's, it, it, it goes beyond. Like, what if you have to find a specific creature to, uh, you know, to summon them because they know something? The research Search downtime activity uh, is one way you can get access to their true name, but you might mm -hmm. use legend lore or other things. And now you're looking to summon a specific uh, creature. Those are cases where the, the, the text of the spell as written uh, is not exactly clear. Mm -hmm. uh, gate will get you a specific creature, but maybe you don't want to have to be, rely on a ninth level spell. Change the spell, change the, uh, you know, the specific use of the spell. Uh, through these sort of in-game consequences of you know, researching things or befriending NPCs, things like that. That's why I like conjuration magic, right? Like that's the fun part of it. The one that pops to mind most immediately uh, for recently is Dresden, mm -hmm. with, with summoning the the little uh, f sprites or fairies, mm -hmm. toot toot, mm -hmm. yes. and all of them. <laughs> but like once he learns his name. Yeah, he can he can summon this thing right and, uh, and specifically, and then bring yeah. friends along later on. Yeah, you know, yeah. but you can build a rapport up with mm -hmm. uh, with mm -hmm. with these little guys. And now we're just sort of like uh, just wild off the wall uh, thinking about like say rewards for players. It's like you could just give this as a reward to it doesn't even have to be a caster. Uh, if they are, you'd be like, yeah, you can use a spell slot to get this specific effect. But like you, Mister Rogue, uh, you know, you befriended this gutter fairy uh, one day, and as a second story man, having a gutter fairy on your side's a great thing. It's not bad. Once a day, you, for a minute. You can make them show up and help you out with something, you know? Yeah. You can crawl down a chimney and unlock a window for you on the other side. <laughs> would, you, would, you, would you crawl down there, come over here you know? to this window? Yeah, right, I it mean... can uh, shake off some guard dogs, things like that, you know? And that's sort of a, a, a way to grant, you know, giving, now that we're, we're way off, of talking about specifically about Conjuration, but giving minor access to power, more powerful magic to lower level characters is a way to both, like, get access to those spells. If you don't get to play D&D &D that often, or, you're, you know, this is still your first campaign and you're just itching to try out something, then there's nothing stopping you as a dungeon master from going like, as an in-game reward, you can cast this spell once a day. And it's any spell you know, that you want, but you know, it could be, uh, say, a mid-range spell that summons a, an ally or something to you. Mm -hmm. So that's uh, one of many ways that you can use conjured creatures. Right? Yeah, 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 we don't, yeah. For, for this conversation, <laughs> ends in the ditch. Right. Let's get back on track, which is uh, uh, mobility and, tel and teleportation. It's another, sure. it's another consideration. It's another, uh, it's a hallmark of conjuration, right? right? Sure, sure. Yeah, I mean, yeah, when you even think of like the conjuring spells, they're just teleporting another creature and then it's like an enchantment effect on the side. Mm -hmm. To me, almost like the, the teleportation effects are, are like an expression of raw transportation magic, conjuration, mobility. It's, it's sort of like, I'm, I'm trying to think of like what magical principle you could you could think to hang it on, but it's I, I use translocation. The term, oh, translocation yeah. or transposition. Transposition is the yeah. one I use mm -hmm. in Star Wars Bound. It's oh like, yeah, yeah. That's that's that is a school of magic <laughs> or a class in the school where you learn teleportation and things right, like right, that. Right, right, right. So yeah, and so there's a lot of ways. How does this work specifically? So like in in baseline D and D, this is where the transitive planes of the astral and the ethereal come into play mm -hmm. because they connect. They they are the uh, metaphysical connective tissue between these planes. That's why they have different sort of properties. And like I think we mentioned in say the evocation school where perhaps the uh, ethereal plane is filled with millions of filaments as 
the magical energies from the inner plane are, are brought forth to the to the prime material. You know, we know that the astral plane is filled with like color pools and gateways and conduits and all sorts of things that connect uh, magic that goes on on the prime plane to both the astral plane and the outer planes as well. Like spell crystals and spell gems are these basically what a summoning spell looks like from the creature's perspective, which is I'm chilling out on my realm of, you know, with the deities or whatever, and, and this thing comes and uh, picks me up. These locations that you're using when you're casting teleportation magic and you're using it, it's worth thinking about. Because uh, in, say, areas of uh, wild magic or frayed magic, maybe these teleportation spells do something different. Their relationship with the transitive plane is different. In Land Between Two Rivers, um, every use of uh, teleportation magic above third level has a small chance to open a portable hole in reality. Like, a dimension door could leave a permanent door there. A ninth level gate spell cast in this world is permanent. It, it never goes away. Da it's dangerous magic to just open a portal somewhere. Uh, it requires no concentration and, and that's, you know, it's led to some significant problems. It's one way of, of thinking about teleportation magic from a campaign perspective and, and not just like, oh, well, great, now I can never imprison my PCs again. Yeah. I'm just misty step out of there. <laughs> well, but that's like, why, that's that's why, why you take that spell. Step. <laughs> exactly, that's why they took it. So yeah, so things to think about is where do they go? Where do they really go? How are they transported uh, mm -hmm. through these realms? Am, am, am I going to have to break out a piece of paper and a pen and do the old fold in half? Oh yes, are we going to do that visual aid? But I mean, is it just that? Right. Is, is the fact of you knowing this magical formula, you're literally connecting that point with this point yeah. and you're using the transitive plane of the ethereal to yeah. fold in half. And to fold in half, right. Is it just a, an airport es uh, ground escalator? You know, like. Right, right, right. <laughs> things live there, yeah. right? How do they feel about someone just driving through their neighborhood? Traipsing through their neighborhood <laughs> just because it's quicker than walking on that. Those are some things to think about. One of the ways in which D&D has sort of played with teleportation magic on like a macro scale is in second edition, the whole arc of the Yugoloths and what happened to the devil and demon's ability to innately teleport at will. Oh, yeah. And wh why did that mysteriously disappear? There's an in-setting, in-game uh, sort of reason for it, a series of adventures that are tied to that, that, that very thing. And, and in my world, it never happened because I like the ability of my mo big monsters to teleport at will. Um, but, <laughs> yeah, yeah, see, that's why. That's why it's worth thinking about because you can take these spells and, and have plots and schemes and things in your game that work on, say, all teleportation magic. What if there was a villain or, or someone out there who was like, yeah, I set up a spell that catches people who try to teleport and it puts them in this trans-dimensional web. You know, it, it catches them there. Or maybe a predator, like a, the next version of a face spider is a creature that can trap you while you're teleport, you know, while you, while you are mid-teleport mm -hmm. or follow you after a teleport, right? Oh, yeah. like, like the Hounds of Tindalos from like the Love, Lovecraft mythos is like, they follow like time travelers and, and things like that. They're just a predator, or at least as I understand, there's like a predator that lives there. You could easily devise a lot of uh, monsters that are just, you don't know what realm <laughs> Dimension Door takes you through. It takes you through a dimension, you know, and in doing so folds dimensions in this world, but that space is put somewhere else. And mm -hmm. maybe the people who you've been dumping extra space onto for all this time have gotten upset about that. Yeah, come there's over no more space. Let you know, <laughs> right? You, you've just filled us up with extra space. It's just worth touching on. The, these spells are fun. They start at Misty Step and go all the way up to Teleport and Gate. There's uses for almost all of them. I, I like Arcane Gate because it's sort of like, it, mm -hmm. even though the distance isn't that great, the fact that it's just sort of there, anyone that walks through, you can uh, take a caravan across a river or a cliff or something like that. Uh, you play a lot of fun with uh, portals with Arcane Gate. That's the oh, yeah. stuff, right? Oh, to oh, totally. Yeah. <laughs> I, I have to say before it's too far away, I can't get the image of a village where all the roads and everything just keep getting longer. Because all the distances that people keep teleporting, whatever, that's where they go. That's where and they so, go. And like, just, oh, oh just, not again. I, my, my walk to work yesterday was five miles. Now right. it's, now it's 50,000. <laughs> right. <laughs> because that damn wizard. <laughs> that damn wizard. You know, we were talking about transmutation of yeah. like the, how to use a, a scientific understanding of the world to mess with the D&D magic system. That's one way, right? Like, yeah. where does all that extra space go yeah. when you magically cut it out of existence? <laughs> 
maybe it's like uh, you know heat or energy. Space cannot be destroyed. It has to be put somewhere. Yeah, it has um, to be maintained. Yeah, right. It has to be conserved. Right. Uh, so that, like I said, it's 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 fun. It's it's interesting. Uh, you could do the opposite, right? And yeah. treat uh, teleportation like they do in say the Dresden verse, where you're teleporting, but you've got to hoof it from point A to point B in this world, and you will come out the other side roughly instantaneously, but for you, there's still a slog. And now you're kind of like a time traveler, right? Yeah. Where you're, you know, you are going to be older uh, every time you arrive than when, you know, than you otherwise suggest. You know, yeah. yeah. And what, but what I do like is like, it's like, well, it's quicker. It may not be better. It's not better. And <laughs> you, you know, like, yeah. you have to go through caverns where you can't breathe. And yeah. so, but, you know, it's only a 30 foot crawl through a cavern that could kill you if you breathe it in yeah. versus, you know, Halfway around the world. There's a really cool uh, moment in The Witcher 3 where, where Geralt is like transported through multiple worlds. And you're sort of like get a scale of the magnitude, particularly from where you started of like hunting down ghouls and taking bounties and things to this moment where you're like just like bamfing through dimensions. And it sort of like, I, I liked it because there, there are moments where this place is obviously hostile. There's others where there's clearly was a civilization here. And it's a chance perhaps to... Uh, reveal information about your homebrew world that you might not otherwise get a chance to. Like, what if uh, the dimension that they travel through is like the far realm, right? And being awake for that, there's a, a mishap in the spell. And yeah, you know, I, I'm usually just using teleport here. I, I know the coordinates of the, the circle I'm trying to get to, but something was off. There was a, a mote of dust on the, on the rune and you're awake for the whole thing. Right, <laughs> and you're you know sort of like exposed to these eldritch energies and beings and and reality for you know however long it's supposed to be instantaneous, but it's not. Oh, see, when you come back, changed. Yeah. There's like a Stephen King story about that, right? I don't know. Anyway, yes. Sorry to interrupt you. I think there is, <laughs> but I was thinking of Guardians of the Galaxy. Whenever they oh, yeah. do, when they port through their, you know, they can only do so many jumps at a time. Yes, uh -huh, and if you uh -huh. do more, it starts warping. Start warping. Yeah, like, exactly. Right. Maybe you have like an in, like the dimensional equivalent of an inner ear. Mm -hmm. That you don't know about, but because we don't live in a world with magic, we you know we don't have one. But maybe you know people in a D and D world do, and just after too many of these, you just I don't know. Maybe you confuse distances or mm -hmm. yeah. Well, and you know what I miss? I miss the old teleport mishap table. It's there, it's but still like, there. If, but if you know the sequence, if you like, I know, but you're it used game to be it, yeah. so much more deadly. Yeah, it did. Like yeah. like you could have that moment in in what was it, Wrath of Breath of the Dragon, <laughs> where you teleport and your arm is in a pillar. That's all I think of is is the wizard who teleports and their arms ends up in a pillar yeah. or their feet are literally in the ground. Another way to limit teleportation magic is is to like adjust that table, mm -hmm. uh, or maybe just get rid of the whole idea of of uh, sort of a, a runic circle that you can automatically teleport to in the first place. If you visited it, then you will have to spend some time visualizing it in your mind, and that's going to take a while. You know, maybe like you can increase the casting time of the spell and in order to make it to safer. Make it safer yeah, and yeah. now you're not like using it as a getaway or something like that. This is why to me, Dimension Door is the sweet spot of teleportation magic, mm -hmm. right? Like I like Misty Step. It's a great second level spell, good for getting out of tight situations. I, I take it on a lot of different casters. To me, Dimension Door is the one where, first off, most dungeons are just like, they're not, e you can easily get out of them with a Dimension Door if you go vertical. Right, like most dungeons aren't that deep underground. Like there are some that will sprawl out and, and the range of Dimension Door, you won't quite be able mm -hmm. to say make it to the entrance. But unless you're really deep in the dungeon, and guess what, Dungeon Masters, that probably means you're not setting your dungeons deep enough. Dimension Door will just like, pop, get you out. Now I'm on the surface. Doesn't matter where I was. Doesn't matter what I was doing. Mm -hmm. No matter what was in the way, how many people I pissed off, I'm out. You, you know? don't have to see the endpoint? I, you can guess, right? Yeah, that's right. Uh, you can guess. Okay. Right. This is why I, I test this with a dwarf first. Well, I was going to say, <laughs> you want a dwarf in the party, like, right. hey, hey how, how, far how far up is up? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. You exactly, know? right, yeah. Uh, or, you, or there's any another, other number of spells that will let you sort of know the, the sort of distance to something or, or where you are. I might let, say, like, druid craft. It might let you sort of, like, tweak druid craft to know something like that. But then druids aren't usually casting uh, Dimension Door. Although, I think some can. I think coastal druids. I, I like Dr Dimension Door for the teleport spells myself. It's sort of my favorite of all of them. The ones that just let you zip across the planet uh, or between dimensions are fun, but it's you're now at a different level of Dungeons and & Dragons, and it, it changes oh, yeah. the game. You know? Oh, yeah. Once you get to plane shift, uh, oh yeah, you know... Yeah, screw it. Screw you know, it. Yeah, you're, you're ripping holes in reality and, right. and walking through. <laughs> I mean, that's like uh, you've unlocked an achievement once you get seventh level spells. Like, that. sure, yeah, yeah. I, I I recently did something similar. I gave a, a, a party a cubic gate. They were ninth level, 
mostly because I just was like, at, at ninth level, a cubic gate is just going to get you in trouble. It's an, it's an adventure generator. Yeah. You know, like, are you guys bored? I don't know. Tap, tap. And mm-hmm. Go on an adventure to whichever one of the seven or six plane, not seven. It's a cube, Jim. Jeez. No, no, you have the seventh. You have the seventh plane. Uh, one of them it's opens the up one. to the seven heavens of Mount Celestia. So I think that's where my, my brain was. Yeah, yeah. It's a tesseract uh, gate thing. Anyway, uh, if you're one of those DMs where the idea of the player sort of zipping around and, and, and bypassing physical obstacles gets to you, then I, I think either uh, doing something about the casting times uh, of the spells uh, or, or making it like not as convenient, you know, making it be line of sight. Yeah, all of them. You've got to see, or at the very least, familiar enough that you can see it in your mind's eye. How you feel about teleportation is how you feel about fast traveling in video games. Oh, sure, sure. I mean, if you yeah. like to run there the whole time, every time, yeah. well, I'm kind of half and half. It depends on how long my session is, quite honestly. If I'm playing a, a session that's between five to six hours, um, then, then I'd rather it not. We have time to, to do a little bit of travel. Yeah. But if I'm playing, say, a session that's under three hours, no, we're fast traveling. You know, yeah, we're, we're getting to where we're going. Unless the point of this particular thing is to highlight some aspect of the journey. Yeah. Right. But usually it's a, a montage scene and, and then we're there. Teleportation just sort of like cuts out. You know, you're just like, mm-hmm. you're there. So we've, uh, we've touched on, uh, you know, like the two big ones, conjuring things and, tele- and, and yeah. mo- movement mobility. What are some highlight spells Ooh, or yeah. spells you would like to highlight? To me, gate is one because gate is a spell that I think is like that. that I, in my mind, I think of as um, blank. It's a mm-hmm. spell that, if it were to exist in the world, uh, I, I see it more of being very much more specific. It's like it's not just won't take you just anywhere. It will take you to this specific location on the specific plane. So gate becomes a template for spells that are like open the pathway to the mountain of heaven, which is a powerful spell because you're bypassing the whole normal. <laughs> you know, uh, standards for having to get into heaven and just walking there. <laughs> and, and, but it's a How'd very, you die? yeah, <laughs> I didn't, I didn't. just, I, I can't just in your arms tonight. <laughs> right. <laughs> uh, but what do you have to do to get that particular spell? What angel do you have to convince or torture perhaps to get access to it, to that information? What uh, spirits of the dead do you have to call forth from their paradise afterlife to, you know, convince to, uh, you know, give you the information that you would need to craft this particular spell. That's why I like gate. It's a template. I, I, I also like giving it out as a scroll. You guys know I like giving out ninth level, eighth and ninth level spells, scrolls, when I can. Um, it, because I think it puts the magic that uh, a lot of players just sort of see and salivate over and wish and wonder, and like, oh my god, what is this going to be like? Mm-hmm. And, and you they, give them wish? And then I give them a scroll of wish, <laughs> or time stop, or shape change, or, you know, whatever it is that I think they would have some fun with. And and whatever it is I'm prepared to deal with in my game, right? Yeah. Very good. Plain shape Shift is a is a close second for mm-hmm. uh, for in terms of that, but yeah. I love the uh, like the tower, the what the Galder's Tower and the Mighty Fortress, uh-huh, right? Stuff like that. Yeah. <laughs> I like the idea of you have this whole building. It just summons a it full just building. Summons a full well, it's building. It's like Darren's entrance fortress, the magic item, right? Yeah. Like I love yeah. that because it's just it's like I need a tower, right? Like I never know when you need a you know you need a tower. Galder's Tower is a spell from the Lost Laboratory of Qualish, I think, one of the Extra Life adventures. So if, if you're wondering where it comes from, it's it's from that adventure, but it's it's worth tracking down because it summons what a, a, a fully furnished. Tower? Well, basically, it's like a well, like a hundred square feet. Each level is ten feet, and you can have like a master bedroom and like a it's observatory. It's a whole list of everything it has like, in it. Like yeah. yeah, and you can do whatever you want to each level. Right, right, right. And um, so if, if you remember how I felt about Le- Leoman's tiny hut, where I was like, I want a tiny hut. Like what I really want is is not this hemisphere of force that's like really kind of cool defensive spell, but like a, a thatched roofed hut. Like I want a peasant's hut that my wizard lives in and just takes mm-hmm. with him. You know, like everywhere he goes, he plays peasant. Yeah. Because, you know, you could just like, oh yeah, I'll just summon this thing into existence. I th- but Galder's Tower is that spell, although it's not a ritual. Yeah. No, it's not. Sadly. It's not. But there's others in this vein, right? Uh, Mighty Fortress, Temple of the Gods. Mm-hmm. Uh, yeah. Magnificent Mansion is kind of like that. So it's anything that builds me, <laughs> that, builds me that I can play Sims with. <laughs> In D and D, and I love that. The, That's like with is. the mighty fortress, you know, like anything else, you, pay, yeah. you it lasts what seven days. Yeah, and yeah. you you cast it every seven days for. Yeah, any yeah, of these ones. permanent. Any of the, any spell that lasts, uh, you know, that is permanent after so many castings has a seal of approval in my book. And in my honest, true heart, I wish every spell had both higher level scaling options and what happens when I cast this spell every day. What happens the, when you cast a fireball every day? Like, what happens if every day I cast a fireball on the same spot? 
Like, you, what would you, happen? You would open a plane. Uh, to me, you would open a portal to the plane of fire. Sure, yeah. You'd finally rip, <laughs> finally rip, finally it, open. rip it open. What about Wish? What do you think of Wish? Uh, you know, Wish is all right, right? Mm -hmm. uh, much like uh, Temple of the Gods to Mighty Fortress, the cleric gets the better, like, a, a version a little bit sooner. Mm, okay. uh, whether or mm -hmm. not it's good or not, you know, whatever. Or yeah. it's better or not. Whether, yeah, usually it's like, they get it sooner, but it's not as powerful, usually, but not always. I think the cleric one is a little bit more powerful, isn't it? Or did Temple I get that flipped? Gods. Anyway, I was thinking about Wish and the, the clerical uh, uh, equivalent. Um, oh, you're thinking about a third edition. I don't think that made the cut to fifth edition. It didn't. Miracle, no divine intervention. Is divine what intervention. Did, uh, what yeah. Claire's getting now. Yeah. Yeah. But yes, similar um, vein. But wish is like it's a pretty cool spell, sure. right? It's nowhere near, near as cool as any as it used to be. Right. But again, said it many times. Fifth edition kind of kind of tamped down pretty much everything's power level a well, little bit. They're finding that sweet spot, right? Yeah. That, and that's what I think they're doing with wish as well. They're finding a sweet spot between the story of wish, which yeah. is whatever you say becomes true in reality. The DM hassle of dealing with that and a cost to a player and coming somewhere where, the, to me, the application of Wish is that it can cast other spells. And it does it like that. It does it without needing a component. It, it's a utility uh, supreme. Mm -hmm. And in that sense, I think it should be called like any spell, which is a spell that if you're spell. familiar with all oh, spell, spell or any spell. Like there's a spell in uh, you know Forgotten Realms lore uh, that is a cleric spell that's used by God, the clerics of the god and goddess of magics uh, that are in the setting. And it's like, yeah, you cast this spell and that allows you to bring forth any other effect. And I think if you look at Wish through that lens, Wish is the ultimate version of, of this type of magic. It's like, with this spell, I can cast any other kinds of spells. But to me, that doesn't fulfill the promise of the story of Wish, which is whatever I utter becomes reality mm -hmm. in the most literal and potentially inconvenient way possible. That's the kind of Wish that, that I really like. Not so much that it gets into the being given a you know like a, a fully written big sheet of paper for what the wish actually is to me the wish is like can you say it in a sentence in one breath you know that's the wish you that's the magic of it right it just happens it's it you've mastered reality to that point but that's maybe a big ask of the D&D system mm -hmm. and most players and campaigns are never going to get there so does it really matter that wish comes with all these costs of like potentially being never being able to cast it again or the things that you can create with it not being as magnificent as you might want. Uh, and so Dungeon Master's looking at Wish, um, you know, you have a lot of power in this regard. Most of the time, you know, you might be using it as a, you know, from a genie or other monster, in which case it does whatever you want it to do. If you've got a caster casting Wish, then, I, you know, I, I'd be tempted to just limit it to the casting other spells options. But for players, for me, I'm taking it to cast other spells mm -hmm. and not necessarily to utter uh, reality-altering uh, you yeah, know, phrases. Because there's also the the old connotation of wish, where it was more like a like the monkey's paw. Right. Yes. I mean, that's the sort of the iconic uh, right. wish uh, sort of story for a lot of gamers. Is quite honestly, that puts a lot of work on the DM. Yeah. You know, that it, it be, I have been put in that position many times in campaigns, either through like I, I didn't quite expect it, and party got access to wishes from say a random roll and. I wasn't yet comfortable saying like no. Being put in a position of like, gosh, there's a, a, a lot of narrative weight here that's riding on my interpretation and and adjudication of this moment in the game. In the past, I, I might have just, I, I don't know that I would have handled any of those particularly well. Now I would I would throw it to the group and I'd be like, listen, let's get let's all get in on this. What is what do we think is a way that this could be interpreted literally, uh, if uh, inconveniently, and um, you know go from there. Yeah. If not, like, just check on what other versions of Wish have done throughout other editions of D&D. There's a lot of advice in other versions of the spells. What are some concepts that, that bubble up to mind uh, for you that you summon forth? That I summon forth? To me, the, the, the first one that I, I, I really think of is, is, uh, is Angel Summoner and BMX Bandit, which <laughs> that Michelin Web look sketch. The sketch itself is a, a, you know, a, a guy that summons angels and solves all the problems. The other guy rides a bike. <laughs> and um, they're a super fighting, crime fighting duo. It, number one, it touches on that, that kind of the, the problem of conjuration, which is, say, uh, a, someone summoning something that's way more powerful than anyone else. And that's one thing. That's sort of the party balance and mechanics. And I think the conjure spells uh, in fifth edition do, do a good job of that. But conceptually, to me, the type of 
creature you summon says a lot about the type of caster you're going to be. Fifth edition, to me, the, the shining star of, uh, of summoners is the druid. They're summoning fey and elementals and, and animals and things like that. Uh, they've got access to planar binding. Uh, so that means that some, some of these creatures they summon, they can keep around for a while. And you mm -hmm. have high-level druids that have a whole entourage of creatures that are there through Awaken and being conjured and animal friendship and uh, planar binding. And you, maybe you're also a moon druid who can turn into elementals yourself. And you start to see the druid as this particular player might be showing up to a game with many actions at their disposal. That's the mechanics of it. The concept of it is what I like though, because I like that idea of, of, of someone showing up and they're like, yeah, I'm, I'm a high level druid. Of course, there is a, a coven of hags that I have at, at my disposal. And of course there are the spirits of powerful animals that I called forth from other planes and, 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 and you know, who formed bodies for themselves uh, to, to fight at my side. And here are other animals that I've you know, uh, uplifted and, and gifted with sentience who are champions of the wilds and places like that. And, and to me, that's a powerful concept. And if I were going for that, it would definitely be one that I'd run by the DM first. Be like, hey, I'm thinking of playing a summoner druid. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, you know, it, it also is a really high level build. It takes a long time to, to get to that level. Uh, and usually by then campaigns have adjusted to, to that level of power. Other than that, like it's difficult to summon angels in, in fifth edition, you know? Mm -hmm. uh, they don't like that. They don't like that. There's <laughs> the conjure celestial spell, seventh level, and there's really only two options unless you use uh, the Guildmaster's Guide to Ravnica, in which case there's four options. Not a lot of uh, uh, Celestials uh, CR4 or lower, so the idea of summoning angels and the like, uh, high level magic through gate and, and using things like planar ally or planar binding to, uh, to get Celestials to, uh, to fight by your side. I mean, the only other concept I can really think of is the super teleporter. Thing. Oh, sure, right, right, to go the other way. You for Take, take yeah. all of the mobility yeah. spells. And take the ones that prevent teleporting so you can, uh -huh. you can stop other people from doing the same thing. Yep, yep, yep. It's sort of like manipulate the teleportation yeah. uh, magic itself. I can see you doing that. I mean, there's a reason why that concept also appears a lot in like psionics. Mm -hmm. Right, where the, the sometimes it's called the nomad or, or something like that, where you know they're messing with dimension and, yeah. and changing Hyper things. Mobile. Sort of like outside of, of specifically conjuring other uh, other creatures, and of course, diabolist and demonologist are powerful concepts. And I've witnessed <laughs> the, how fun a spell like summon lesser demons can be when you just cast it and shut the door on them <laughs> with your demons and the bad guys. <laughs> Uh, there was that moment in the evil campaign where uh, the, uh, our party necromancer had uh, you know, summoned a horde of zombies and sent them after enemies and they were just like, I'll also summon some demons for good measure and we'll just wait out here in the magic circle till, it, till they're gone. Mm -hmm. you know? <laughs> They'll just do their thing. And it was like, eh, the monsters cleared out the dungeon for you and you just get to clean up and deal with the political consequences afterwards. So there's fun that can be had with that, um, those spells, particularly if you pay attention to the material components and how you get them. And finding character concepts that fit the creatures that you're summoning is, is also a, an interesting way to approach it. But what about just like the elementalist as a concept, right? Like yeah. a, the master of elemental magic. To me, it's a combo of, of the three evocation, conjuration, and transmutation, but it's a strong one, right? Like, there's a lot of fun you could have with being, like, an elemental magic master. Uh, yeah, yeah, especially if you add in uh, uh, a little abjuration. Yeah. With the investitures or whatever. Uh-huh, oh, yes, uh, yeah. But, I mean, there's a lot of fun to be had if you wanted to <coughs> basically be the avatar. Right. Like, I mean, that's, because that's what, that's what you're basically going for. Yeah. Is manipulating all, all four elements, mm -hmm. you know, being able to move earth around while, while slinging some water and throwing some fireballs. So is that a conjurer? Like a wizard conjurer? Is it a sorcerer? What do you think? I don't think sorcerer, you get enough spells for it to really matter. Yeah, you think it's a wizard? You think yeah, it's a, probably a subset a wizard. Of wizard. I, think, I don't think there's a subclass in druid yet to support it. To me, there's not a, there's not I think yet. there should be. There's not yet like a dedicated blaster subclass for druid. I fixed that yeah. with Lamb Between Two Rivers, but you guys don't know about that yet. A druid that's focused on like using their offensive magic in the same way that an evoker would mm -hmm. or a dragon sorcerer would. You could do that with, uh, with a druid. Yeah, I think an elements elemental list with like the right bonus spells. Yeah. Or Druid. Custom be. abilities, bonus spells, yeah. Not quite land, I guess maybe, yeah. So those are some of the concepts that I kind of think of. And, and like I said, most of it's based around the creatures that they would summon or their their relationship with, uh, with teleportation magic. Head on over to Patreon for our weekly podcast and so much more. WebDM is also on Twitch with three weekly games, which we upload to WebDM Plays, our second YouTube channel.
we still rolling? Because if we're still rolling, I'll just talk about these spells that I think should exist for contracts. Like, to me, there's not enough magic that pulls objects in the same way that summons creatures. Like, draw midges instant summons is kind of like that. But you have to set it up ahead of time. It's like six levels, something like that. Like, I want a spell that's like, okay. I can summon this specific thing to my hand, mm -hmm. even though I've never seen it before. Or I can summon a generic version of it. Like, I guess more like the the conjurer's ability to summon inanimate objects, but in a spell form. Yeah. Yeah. I just have that because of a, a magic item in Invisible Sun. Okay. Yeah. I have a silver bracelet that allows me to summon anything. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Any yeah. mundane item? Any mundane item, yeah. Yeah, I'm just like, I need a spoon. 